<laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den. With me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Well, you know the drill by now. We are going on with the DM guide, specifically the reshoot for the Putting It All Together episode. We are on to part three, and like I said last time, we are moving on to this particular story's BBEG, the big bad evil guy, the main boss, the final villain, the climactic confrontation. Now, something I should note here, for this particular story, this is an, an elder for a druid circle, a particularly ancient druid circle, and he was tied to one of the primary spirits that comprise the heart of this very ancient forest that this uh, that this particular druid circle has tended to for countless generations at this point so this should give you an idea on the kind of potency the level of power that the players should be grappling with and to reflect that i built this character to be an absolute wrecking ball just a total nightmare so much so, especially since it's a, a full spellcasting class, given that he's a druid, this particular section will be broken up into its own two individual parts. We're going to start off with the general stuff, his class abilities, feats, and skills, and then next time around we'll start diving into spells and skill, or spells and uh, his equipment, rather, not his skills. Um, the reason, and the reason for that is it just would make this video too long to try to run through both. In fact, I've recorded this particular episode a couple of times now, and it just seems to suit us better if I break this up into just two separate, much more manageable chunks. So, with that said, let's get going with taking a look at Elias Briarthorn, Keeper of the Third Stone. Now, First thing to note, he's a neutrally evil aligned human, level 13 druid, specifically with the archetype Blight Druid, meaning he's not so concerned with the growing and tending of the forest, uh, going about the natural order of things. He's just full of this hateful, corrupting, undulating wrath that courses through his veins. And his corruption is spreading out. He's inflicting this upon the forest. Its denizens, the creatures, the myriad spirits around him are being afflicted with this wrath. And the crap is spreading. Now, I, I, I'll, blah, blah, ugh, I allotted his stats here. You'll see he's got a strength of 14, dexterity of 15, constitution of 18, wisdom of 20, and, you know, reasonable charisma of 14. Now, these stats are definitely above average, certainly, and uh, definitely ideally distributed for a spellcasting character, at least for a druid. Um, we're not so worried about his strength. Actually, you know, honestly, if you want to bump up the stats, you can. You're a dungeon master, you're a story, but uh, I rolled them and this is what I ended up coming up with. And please feel free to adjust if you want to go with more of a point buy orientation for buying them just to level things out a bit. You can certainly do that, but I would say focus mostly on his constitution and on his wisdom, since his wisdom is going to be giving his spells just a little bit more oomph. But moving on from there his perception ability is maxed out and topped out with a couple of little extra bits of gear that assist with that at an impressive 21 and he's got a plus six for his initiative armor class is 17 and a 137 hit points so he's pretty beefy for a spellcaster even for a druid but, you know, that's not all there is to this. He's got really great fortitude and will saves. Reflexes are okay. He's got a damage reduction of 10, uh, unless it's an adamantium weapon that he's being struck with. And the spell save DCs are 15 plus the spell level. Now, the reason why you want all this information right here, and if you're running this campaign, definitely keep these bits of information towards the top of your notes for Elias Briarthorn. Reason is, when you're running him as a combat encounter, these are going to be relevant bits of information, specifically the perception right on top there. That's what you're going to be rolling in case the players are wanting to get the drop on him. And it's going to be incredibly difficult, considering that even if he rolls a 5 on the d20, he's got a 26 towards spotting anybody making their stealth checks. So... 
certainly it's going to be difficult for the players to get the drop on him. And this doesn't even counter in any other magical abilities he may have on hand in order to counteract this kind of subterfuge and stealth that may be coming his way. Uh, the other thing you want to keep track of is his initiative, how hard it is to hit him, how much punishment he can take, and then what his various saves are going to be versus whatever abilities the players may have. And then you have his damage reduction, which will be helping to protect him a little bit and make sure he's a bit more durable and longer lasting during these combat encounters. And then, of course, the spell save information. Well, you get the idea. He's going to be throwing spells at the players. The players are going to have their own saves that they're rolling. This way, you have that information right there, handy and ready to go, and you're not having to flip through, you know, a page or so of character information for the uh, for the climactic fight. You can just be boom, 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 and move right along with it. And following right along with that chain of logic, we have his attacks listed next. Rot Talon. Now, we'll get more into what Rot Talon is later. Suffice it to say, it is a magical scimitar. It He gets two attacks with it, plus 13, plus 8, 1d6, plus 4 points of damage, 18 to 20 for a crit range, which deals double damage if he confirms the crit, plus 1d6 Flesh Rot which Flesh Rod effect is a custom effect that I threw in here. I figure it fits well with this motif, this idea of this Blight Druid with this all-consuming hatred that is not only manifesting as a spiritual corruption, but is becoming a physical form of decay as well. And it's permeated and expel expelled itself from his body down into his equipment. So now it deals negative energy damage or necrotic damage if you decide you want to adapt this character over towards 5th edition or any other uh, systems that may have different kinds of uh, damage types. Now, he can also power attack with this weapon, t subtracting 3 from his attack power and adding plus 6 to damage, which goes up to a plus 9 if he's two-handing the weapon. Although, you know, uh, that may not be his first choice. And then you have Plague Heart, which is a staff that also functions like a spear. It uh, same attack ranges. It does 1d8 plus 5 points of damage because he is two-handing it. Uh, crits on a 20 times 3 for damage and the plus 1d6 for flesh rot. And uh, there's also a fortitude save of DC 21 and we need to see the plague bearer ability which is coming down further along here. And this of course follows the same rules for power attack but because it's a two-handed weapon, we don't have to worry about the plus six for damage. He's just going to be getting the plus nine right there, right off the bat. But after that, we come down to the class abilities. Now, the Blight Druid archetype does some interesting things with the Druid class. And I picked it because it is one of the better archetype options. It's probably one of the best options if you're not too concerned about the alignment of the character that you're playing or the effect that the character has on the rest of the party npcs or anything else you're going through uh, but anyways he gets nature's bond which he gets a familiar like a wizard does in this case it's a blighted toad he has access to the destruction domain which gives him destructive smite eight times a day and he gets plus one half his level as a morale bonus to damage so plus six points of damage anytime he uses destructive smite so he can really start jacking up that damage output really really easily even without having to go into his wild shape he also has a destructive aura that radiates around him out to 30 feet lasts for one round per level doesn't have to be used up all at once but all attacks from his allies get a plus six to damage and all critical hits are automatically confirmed absolutely great support aura for him to unleash and help uh, help his allies out he also gets a series of domain spells first of which is true strike which will add bonuses to a single attack he gets the shatter spell uh, a ray spell and it uh, inflicts critical wounds for his fourth level spell at fifth he gets shout sixth level is harm and seventh level is disintegrate now you'll be able to look up all of these spells yourselves later um, not to mention i will go over what each of these does in the next episode when we start covering these spells although i will mention we're not going to go super in depth 
but I'll be giving you a gist on what some of these do. Uh, in particular for you new players or new DMs and storytellers that uh, are wanting to just have a little bit more of an idea to get you started. He also gains vermin empathy, which improves the attitude of vermin creatures to unfriendly rather than just being outright hostile. He will take a minus four penalty with regular animals, however, unless they have the disease special attack, which ties into the whole thing I described earlier about this spiritual corruption manifesting and spreading to other creatures. This gives him a better degree of control over at least the infected animals that live in this region. And other bonuses that are more of a customary nature, but again, we'll get into that later when I, on the next episode when I get into his magic items and equipment. Uh, he'll also get Nature Sense, which gives him a plus two bonus to Knowledge, Nature, and Survival skill checks, which, you know, it's not huge, but it's great, and it's ne never going to turn your nose up at a solid bonus there. Uh, Woodland Stride, which treats natural growth, uh, ter a difficult terrain that's resulting from a natural growth as normal terrain for him, so... Any thick brambles or briars, thorny brush and bushes or terrain that, uh, you know, fallen logs and the like will be treated as easy terrain for him to move through. It's not going to take him double his movement to get through it. Whereas the players, unless they also have this ability or a similar ability that produces the same effect, will struggle to keep up with him as he moves through this natural terrain. He also has a miasma. Adjacent creatures need to make a DC 21 fortitude save or they are sickened for one round. This is great because it is just a static effect that he generates. It's there's no there's no action economy associated with it. He's not spending any actions. He doesn't have to move. It's not a limited use. It's just a constant lasting effect. So anybody that's engaging in melee with him has to continuously and regularly make these fortitude saves or be sickened for a whole round which again the status effect is not huge and it's certainly nothing that's going to be permanent and can be fixed with a couple of spells but it still applies penalties and may force the other uh, force the players to try to buff up remove the effect or just do something in order to negate it rather than deal damage to him he also gets wild shape five times a day where he transforms into either huge all, all the way from huge to diminutive sized animals elementals or plant creatures and wild shape is really the bread and butter for any druid but in particular this uh, being able to transform into a plant creature is important to this particular character's strategies Certainly it's not the only option and definitely come up with some other ideas or creative uses for this character, but what I have in mind, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. He's also blight blooded, which renders him immune to all supernatural and normal diseases. He'll be immune to sickened and nauseated effects as well. So he carries this horrific disease with him, this corruption, as well as a myriad number of other awful plagues and afflictions but he is immune to them he's just a carrier at this point uh, think of like a, a typhoid mary for all intents and purposes and going right along with that he, the plague bearer ability touch attacks unarmed strikes and natural weapons force the target set to make dc 21 fortitude saves or contract the disease as a contagion spell which in this case, I picked up Blinding Sickness. This makes the target sickened, fatigued, and then exhausted. And standard actions will require fortitude saves, or the player will lose the action upon failure. And the real kicker here, failing two fortitude saves will, re will render the target permanently blinded. Now, it can be reversed with remove... Uh, remove curse and other mean there are other means of uh, reversing the blindness but until some magical effect takes place for all in, uh, they are physically blinded the disease just destroys their optic nerves or kills the uh, 
and kills the functionality of the eyes. The pupils can no longer expand, contract. They turn that milky white, or you can describe it in any number of different ways. Point being, this is a really, really awful effect to have because targets that are in melee with him or get struck by him risk becoming blind and anybody who becomes blind is going to have a hell of a time trying to fight him in melee fight him in any way shape or form honestly so again it will keep the players having to spend their abilities their spells various actions towards removing all of these awful status effects which means they are waste it's not a waste of time but they're having to burn a lot of resources just to keep themselves in the fight while he just has to keep hitting and touching them and inflicting pain on them in order to win so very much so the players are going to have to be prepared get tricky find all sorts of clever ways to do their research and get ready for this particular fight also, this should already be emphasizing to you that if the players are foolish enough to go and try to decapitate the head from this particular Hydra early, they're going to learn very hard, very fast. That's a terrible plan. But anyways, we still have his feats and skills to get through here, as well as some general tactics. Now, first up here listed are the general uh, druid proficiencies. So weapon proficiencies with Clubs, daggers, darts, quarterstaves, scimitars, scythes, sickles, short spears, slings, spears, and natural attacks. They also gain proficiency with light and medium armor and shields, although that's limited to only wood or hides. Um, and for these other other things, you know, it's it's just general proficiency stuff. But the feat selection here, this is really going to do a lot again to affect his combat abilities. First off, Natural Spell is probably the most important. I highly recommend if you're modifying this particular character build in any way, shape, or form to suit what you have in mind, at the very least keep Natural Spell, because this lets him cast his spells while in his wild shape. Otherwise, he'll be cut off from the bulk of what makes a full spellcasting class so damn terrifying. No sense in crippling yourself. I mean... If you don't feel the need for this or you have some other clever idea, then hey, go with that. But my general recommendation would be to keep the natural spell feet in place. The others are certainly negotiable and uh, can be swapped out for different builds that you may have in mind. But continuing with what I have here, we also have combat casting, which gives them a plus four bonus to casting defensively. Improved initiative to help them if not go first, at least let him keep up at a decent place within the turn order, unless he just rolls like absolute crap. But then we have Quick Draw, which lets him draw his weapon, or draw a weapon as a free action, so he can, again, keep his act his own action economy going at such a pace where uh, he can, instead of having to take a move action to draw a weapon, he can instead draw for free and throw out a spell real fast. We also have combat reflexes and then the standstill feat which essentially if he hits the target he can stop them from moving past his threatened range then we also have power attack and cleave so power attack cleave and combat reflexes incredibly handy feats to have and work together especially in a situation where well say a huge plant creature has reach really 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 good to have and i hope you can see where i'm going with this now for his skills the skills are listed here just more of as a, a general sense of thoroughness on my own part he gets a climb of plus six fly plus 11 handle animal plus 11 which that'll be handy for if you have any scenes in mind where this particular character might be taming the different wild beasts to in order to calmly without any undue injury spread his corruption to the creature although he'll still be taking a penalty to that even still having it as a decently fairly well um, bumped up skill will be handy then heal plus nine knowledge geography plus 14 same for knowledge nature of course perception is a plus 21 altogether 
Ride of plus 6, Spellcraft of plus 13, Survival of plus 16, and then Swim plus 6. Spellcraft will be a handy one as well, especially if there are enemy casters within the, uh, the players or any opposition he may have coming his way. He'll be able to identify spells that are being used as spell effects, magic items, well... Maybe not so much magic items right off the bat, but he'll have a better idea of what spells may be coming out of different items. In any case, with this character, ideally what you are going to do is you're going to use a lot of his spells to layer the ground with all different kinds of traps, hindering terrain, damage dealing things, static effects that are going to last for quite a while in order to cut off escape routes and keep people penned in with him and then he'll change into a form with reach for combat. In particular, for this case, I picked out a treant, or an end. Uh, basically think giant tree person. If you've seen Lord of the Rings, you the Lord of the Rings films, or read the books, you have an idea, or if you're a veteran gamer, you probably also know what a treant is. In any case, he will use the raw might of this form and its reach to keep opponents from escaping, and uh, force basically try to do everything he can to force significant threats into combat with him. And even though he goes into his treant form, he still has the plague bearer ability. So as he hits them, he can still spread the blinding sickness to them for every single hit. Now, he also has Power Attack and Cleave to help increase that damage output, as does Combat Reflexes and Stand Still, like we mentioned before, will help to keep people from escaping by him, at least as easily as they might otherwise. So, this is going to be a very significantly difficult fight, just right here from the outset, and we haven't even gone into his spells yet, or any other magic gear that he has on hand. But that'll be for the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed today's addition to the Putting It All Together series. This has been the Big Bad Evil Guy. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you like this and see where this is going. And I hope that this inspires you to create some very cunning, ruthless, and dangerously capable enemies for your players to overcome. Because while it is nice to have easy things to kind of just bowl over plow your way through overcoming incredible challenges is incredibly rewarding in and of itself even if they can't overcome it if it just turns into a really good epic fight with great role play where everybody's into it even moments of defeat can become incredible parts of stories it may be the closing of a book for that particular party as they end in death and defeat but it's the beginning of a whole nother story for other adventurers from on far who've heard the tales of the crazed druid Elias Briarthorn who spread his blight and collection, uh, corruption through the Alaran Hills and even defeated powerful adventurers that had tried their best to stand in his way and failed. And now it's up to these new adventurers to take up their arms, to journey up northwards and try to fight their way through all these creatures that are just spreading outwards from there. It's this cancerous tumor just uh, takes root and takes hold and starts devouring everything in its path. Really, really good story there. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Next episode, like I said, we'll be covering his spell list. With that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. You all have yourselves a good night, and thank you for your time.